The title of this message is Why Without the Physical Temple or the Levitical Priesthood as Required Under the Law of Moses Do We as Yahweh's People Today Still Keep or Memorialize the Passover, the Feast of Eleven Bread? Some people say, well, we don't have a temple, we don't have a priesthood. You can't really go and sacrifice a lamb like you used to anymore and, uh, and do all that. So, can you, you know, it was supposed to be in the land. So, why, so we can't even really keep the Feast of Eleven Bread, right? That's what some people believe. But we're going to see why we still do. Is that all right? So, many consider the looking for the new moon and the keeping the feast or, or days or the moed times of Yahweh. Moed means appointed times, Yahweh's appointed times, uh, that, that were found in his law calendar. And so m many people consider these days and times as done or way with or just for the Jews. But Yeshua said this, my brothers and sisters, look at Matthew's number five, chapter five. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So obviously, abolish and fulfill means two different things. For I tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke or a, of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So as far as I, I can see, brothers and sisters, we still have heaven and earth, right? When you look up in the sky, did you guys see a heaven out there when he was out there? Anybody coming in? You see, we, we, this is the planet earth we're on. So, so Yahweh, Yeshua has not done away with his commandments, his laws, and, and in this particular sense, referring to his feast days. Amen? The scripture shows that Father Yahweh meant for these feast days and their corresponding Sabbaths to be, to be given to his kingdom people. You know, and they were to keep them. And, and these feasts, this keeping of the feasts was to be a practice that endures to all their generations. That's what the scripture shows. All their generations until heaven and earth pass away, right? This is, this is what, you know, all these people are supposed to do on this earth. Amen? I, you know, again, we still see a heaven and earth up there. And so therefore... These things have not passed away, or they have not been abolished. Let's look at Isaiah 66, talking about enduring feast days. Isaiah 66 says, For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure, say endure, will endure before me, save Yahweh. So your descendants and your name will what? Endure. Talking about, um, talking to his people, Israel, and their descendants and will, will endure, you know. But from, it says from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all who? Mankind. All mankind will come to worship before me, says Yahweh. As they go forth, they will see the corpses of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worm will never die, their fire will never be quenched, and they will be a horror to all mankind. So we're talking about during the millennial reign, Yeshua is going to have um, the descendants, uh, you know, of Israel and, uh, and, and all mankind, keeping his feast, his Sabbath days, look, observing his new moons. Now, how many know that no matter what your ethnicity, your nationality, if by faith you're saved in Messiah Yeshua, you are children of Elohim and descendants of Abraham. How many know that? Amen? Amen? By faith, Abraham, the father of faith. Let's look at Genesis 17, 5. It says, no longer will you be called Abram, but Yahweh changed his name, but your name will be called Abraham, which means a father. Of many nations, for because Yahweh says, "For I have made you a father of many nations." So, as a matter of fact, even natural Israel, physical descendants of Abraham, if they don't have the faith that Abraham has, they are not his children. Amen. 
However, those of other nations who have the same kind of faith, say faith, that I interpret as intimate relationship with Yahweh, trusting him with your all, you know, with your whole life. That's what faith is. Become, if, if, you, if you are of faith, you, you have become grafted into Yahweh's spiritual kingdom as spiritual Israel. Amen? Let's look at Galatians 5. We got a lot of scriptures to go through, so we're going to go through these, try to make this quickly. It says, you are all sons of Elohim through faith in Messiah Yeshua. For all of you were baptized into Messiah, have clothed yourselves with Messiah. There is neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Just like Abraham, Israel, you are Israel. You are, you are you're Israel in Yeshua. Amen? Spiritual Israel. Abraham's seed according to the promise. So let's look, at, let's look again at Isaiah 66. Again, it says, For just as the new heavens and new earth, which I make to, to will, will endure before you, declares Yahweh, and your descendants and your name will endure. So the new moon and from one noon to, to new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind and what, will come and worship before me, uh, says Yahweh. I want you to look at the word Sabbath. Sabbath. So in Strong's Concordance, every, every Sabbath, it, 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 it talks about uh, how this is talking about every Sabbath that Yahweh has. And, and it's in the most intensive form uh, from, from Shabbath. It, it, uh, it's an intermission. And an example, specifically the Sabbath, but then you have here a, every Sabbath. And so the Hebrew word here isn't just isolated to mean only the weekly Sabbath or the weekly seventh-day Sabbath, which is today. It, this, this word here includes even the yearly feastly Sabbaths. Amen? The, the yearly feastly Sabbaths, and, you know, such as tabernacles. If we look at Leviticus 23, um, uh, 28, we see that, and this is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, it says these offerings are in addition to the offerings of Yahweh's Sabbaths. The same word is used here, Shabbat, Shabbat. And in addition, because you were, bring, you were to bring offerings, that was part of your worship. And it says in addition to your gifts and to your vow offerings and all your free will offerings you, you give to Yahweh. Now let's look at Zechariah, another scripture that talks about Zechariah 14. Many of you are familiar with this. It says, when all the survivors from the lands, from the nations that came against Jerusalem, again, we're talking about during Yeshua's future millennial reign, when he's going to rule over the whole planet. All the survivors, because you know Yeshua's going to come, and, and he's going to destroy and wipe out all the, 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 the anti-Messiah and all those that had the mark of the beast on them. They're it's going to come and fire is going to come out of his mouth. He's going to, just, he's going to wipe, wipe them all out. And so um, it came against Jerusalem. will go up year after year. This is during the millennial reign. And do what? Worship, right? The king, Yahweh of hosts, which we know is Yeshua, right? And to celebrate the feast of tabernacles. So celebrating these, these appointed days and bringing our offerings are forms of worship. Amen? Let me hear you say worship. There are forms of worship that, that are to be reminders to us of Yahweh Elohim's past, present, and future work or plan of redemption for the generations, for all generations of his kingdom people. Amen? Amen? Let's give Yahweh praise. Amen? Hallelujah. That's what the feasts are about, his, his plan of salvation. So during King Yeshua's millennial reign, the whole earth will be his kingdom, right? So let's look at Isaiah 66 one more time. And I want to, we, we already talked about, read about how he's, he's going to endure. And, and, you know, from one new moon and the Sabbath, all mankind will worship Yahweh, says Yahweh. But I want to, again, focus on verse 24. As they go forth, they will see. And so as we're walking forth, if we're, if we're alive at that time, we will see the corpses of the men who have rebelled against him. 
against me, Yahweh says. You know, talking about the anti-Messiah and, and, and all those with, the, the, you know, the names of the, the number of the, of the beasts on them. For, for their worm will never die. Their fire will never be quenched. And they will be a horror to all mankind. Now, let's, let, let's compare that to Malachi. For also a reference to, to, the, to the millennial kingdom. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. And this is not talking about the lake of fire. This is talking about when Yeshua comes and he's going to come in judgment on, on, on the world and the nation when he comes. You know, he burned like a furnace when all the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day is coming when I will set them ablaze, says Yahweh of hosts. Not a root or branch will be left of them. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, talking about Yeshua, will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go out and, and leap like calves from the stall. That means us, his people. When you, when you will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes. That's what happens when you burn up, right? You get, become ashes, right? They will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day I am preparing, says Yahweh of hosts. Sounds scary. Not, not, it's only scary to those who are wicked. We don't, we don't have to be scared, right? In, this, in the righteousness. Okay? Remember the law. Now, this is the key. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him for all Israel at Horeb. So Yahweh, in, during his millennial reign, is going to bring back, you know, you know, you know, the law of Moses. It caused the whole world to remember the law of Moses. During King Yeshua's millennial reign, there will be a new temple, we see the scripture says, and, 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 and the Levitical priesthood will, will be reestablished. And at that time, the prophet says that the nations will be able then to keep the yearly feast, so, you know, such as unleavened bread, according to the law of Moses again, because the temple will be back there. Now, I don't believe that they're going to be keeping, you know, uh, keeping it, the, uh, you know, the temple sacrifices and little priests for sin, but I believe it will be an object lesson because we're, this, this king, Yeshua, who's ruling the earth, is a new covenant king. He's fulfilled those, those sacrifices of animals on Calvary, but I believe that we'll be able to see, you know, as an object lesson because there's no better way than, than the law of Yahweh to sh when you see an innocent life, a substitute lamb being slain, to, 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 to memorialize the work of Yeshua the Messiah that he did, you know, on our behalf. Amen? Amen? And so we're going to be able to see that. And so, so, Yah so Yahweh's going to bring that back. But today, there is no physical temple. Today, there is, there is no Levitical priesthood that can work in that temple. So we cannot keep the feast exactly according to the letter of the law of Moses. How many know that there are three yearly feasts every year, right? Uh, three yearly feasts that, and by which, at which time that we are supposed to, every man's not supposed to come before Yahweh empty-handed. This is one of the feasts, the Feast of Eleven Bread coming at, at this evening at sunset. So look at Exodus 23. It says here, three times a year you are to celebrate a feast to me. That's to Yahweh, right? It's all about him. You are to observe the feast of unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed times in the month of Abib. This is around this time here. You are to eat unleavened bread for seven days because that was the month you came out of Egypt. No one may appear before me empty handed. You are also to observe the feast of harvest. That's the feast of weeks, Pentecost with the first fruits and produce from what you sow in the field and observe the Feast of Ingathering, another name for tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, at the end of the year, which is we know tabernacles is in the fall. When you gather your produce from the field, three times a year all your males are to appear before Yahweh Elohim. And so at this time, you know, we're not, we're not able to go up to Jerusalem, you know, um, and, and bring an offering to a physical temple or, or, or Levitical priesthood as exactly was done in Moses' time. But wherever we are 
in the world, we still worship Yahweh during his Moed times. As much as we worship according to as much of the truth as we can that we see in his word. So during these three feasts, we still have every male come up and bring an offering. Now, if you don't have the money today or, or the offering you want to bring, you know, you know for Yahweh today as a male, we'll, 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 we'll make some time for you. Uh, either the last day or, to, or, or to, tomorrow, or, uh, which is uh, well, after Sunday, Sunday the daylight part, which is the first day of the, uh, the 15th of, of uh, Unleavened Bread. So, but we, we're being obedient to Yahweh's commandments, amen? Let's look, at, let's look at Mark 14, 24. It says, He, Yeshua, said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you that never will I drink of the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of Elohim. Amen? So if we, look, we could compare that with Luke 22, which is a parallel scripture, 15. It says, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before my suffering. For I tell you that I will not eat it, meaning the meal, again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. Many people, brothers and sisters, interpret Yeshua as saying that when he, as Elohim in the flesh, comes back and establishes his, his millennial kingdom on earth, he will once again eat the Passover meal that his, that his disciples during, uh, his, I mean, with his disciples during um, the Feast of Eleven Bread. You know, and as we've seen, the scripture suggests that he'll cause the law of Moses to be remembered again by the whole world of whom during, during his the yearly feast, Sabbath, Sabbaths, and according to the law, they, they will come up and memorialize his feast every year and, and give a, bring an offering and worship the king, Yeshua. Amen? So from old covenant to new, we see that these, day, these feast days are not just for natural Israel, but they're for all Yahweh's kingdom people. Amen? Let's look at, math, at uh, Numbers 15. Numbers 15, 15 says, The assembly is to have the same statue for you, for both you and the foreign resident. So, so he's talking to his people, Israel. This is in the Old, in the Old Testament scriptures. The same statue. There's not a different statue for, for, for the Jews and for Israel and, and for the Gentiles who join themselves as, as Yahweh's kingdom people. It says, for both you and the four residents, it is a permanent statue for the generations to come. You and the foreigner shall be the same before Yahweh. There's not a different, different thing before, you know, for, for Israel and, and for, the, for the Jews and, the, and a different thing for, for, for the people. So it's, he goes on and says, the same law, the same ordinance will apply both to you and the foreigner residing with you. And we, we see this, in, now go to the New Testament scripture of Ephesians 4. It says, there is one body, one spirit. It was the same, right? Just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, Yeshua, one faith, amen? There's not a different faith for the Jews and a different faith for the Gentiles. One baptism, one Elohim and Father of all, who is all, who's over all and through all and in all, amen? So Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and forever, brothers and sisters. These days are given to all who by faith in Messiah are grafted into Yahweh's kingdom family, Let's look at Ephesians 2, 14, or Ephesians 2, 11. Therefore, remember the formerly, that formerly you, you who are Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcised that done in the body, you know, uh, by human hands. Verse 12, remember that at that time you were separated from Messiah, alienated back under the old covenant. Anyone who, was, who didn't become a, join themselves as a part of Israel 
was alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers to the covenant of promise. They didn't have, salvation was, was something they could not have unless they, by faith, joined themselves unto the kingdom people of Israel, you know, under the old covenant. In other words, the Gentiles were not Yahweh's kingdom people as Israel was. But we know Israel broke the covenant. And so we look at verse 12. It says that the Gentiles were without hope and without Elohim in the, in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Messiah, for he himself is our peace. That's what we, we were singing about being overwhelmed, how we praise him and, he, and our, our peace outweighs the bad, right? He himself, Yeshua is that peace that we were singing about, right? Amen? Our peace who has made the two one and has torn down the dividing wall of hostility. Amen? It was a hostility because if you're Yahweh's kingdom people and you're in Yahweh and the world and, and the Gentiles are, are not Yahweh's people and they're in the flesh, there's an enmity, there's a hostility between you. That's natural because what is of the flesh is of the flesh and, and, is, and what is of the spirit is of the spirit and the two don't mix, right? And so, so what we have here is Yahweh, Yeshua came down and, and, and he tore down the wall of hostility he, by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees he, he, we're ta now, we're not talking about Yahweh's law as far as uh, his law stands forever. We're talking about the commandments and decrees that say that, 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 that you who were far off are under penalty and, 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 and are the enemy. Yahweh's law is against you because you have not kept it. Yahweh, Yahweh has abolished that. So, and, he, and he did this to create in, in himself one new man out of the two. There was, there was a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, thus making peace and, 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 and reconciling both Israel and, 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 and the Gentiles. To, you know, he reconciles both of them of, uh, in Elohim into one body through the cross by which he extinguished their hostility. He came and preached peace, say peace, to you who were far away and peace, say peace. To those who were near. So, so he came and he brought, Yeshua brought peace first to the Jew, first to Israel, the lost tribes of Israel. And then when they rejected, he also brought peace to, to uh, the Gentiles. Now we know that not all of Israel rejected Yeshua. His disciples, the first disciples were all Israel, Jews, natural Israel. But, but, but as a nation, as a whole, Israel rejected Yeshua as the Messiah. Amen? But, they all, but, but we all have access to the Father by one spirit. So Romans 11, 11 goes, on and says, goes on and says this, talking about the engrafting of the Gentiles. It says then, did they stumble so as to lose their share, meaning Israel? Certainly not. However, because of their trespass, because the, those among them the majority of, of Israel as a nation rejected Yeshua. He was the stone that the builders rejected. Salvation has come to the Gentiles and, and, and to, to make Israel jealous. Am I saying this or is the word saying this? The word of Yahweh saying this. Why are they jealous? Because they, will, they learned that, that they were cut off. They were cut off from what? There still, there was still a nation of Israel. So, what, what, so they were cut off as Yahweh's kingdom people, as spiritual Israel. And they became lost, just like the rest of the world. And, 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 and so and the Gentiles be, became, became what you would call spiritual Israel. They, they, they found the true Messiah. Amen? And so, so they're going to be made jealous. But look at verse 12. It says, but if their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I am speaking to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. This is the apostle Paul speaking. He says, I magnify my ministry in the hope that I may provoke my own people. Because Paul is one of the, the Jews who, who, um, who is saved. One of the small remnant of the Jews who believed and had faith in Messiah. 
but he wants to provoke his own people to jealousy to save some of them. Notice he said some of them because the majority of them were lost of that generation, you know, but so some may be saved. And for if they, their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the first part of the dough is holy, so is the whole batch. If the root, and that's, I thought I'd highlight that because we're talking about unleavened bread, right? The first part of the dough is holy, there's no, sinless, you know, justified, you know, then so is the whole batch. If the root is holy, because remember sin represents, I mean, leaven, leaven represents sin. If the root is holy, so is the branches. Amen? How many know that Yeshua is divine and we are the branches? Amen? Amen? Now, if some branches have been broken off, remember, again, he says some, because not all Israel was broken off. Some, like Paul and the disciples of Yeshua, were not broken off. Okay? If some it were broken off and you, the wild olive shoots, the Gentiles were wild out in the world, just doing their own thing. And, you know, they didn't have the, the Torah. They didn't have the oracles of Yahweh, you know, to, to lead and guide them, to, 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 to let them know that they were sinners in need of a savior. But they were just wild and crazy. He says, if you, the wild, have been, have been broken off, um, and, you know, if you've been grafted in among the others to share the nourishment of the olive root, do not boast over those branches. Do not, we, don't, we can't boast over Israel, natural Israel, who've been cut off. Because if you do, remember this, Paul says, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Amen? We don't support Yeshua. Yeshua supports us. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. That's correct. They were broken off because... Of unbelief, there was no faith in Yeshua on Israel as a nation, the natural Israel, the, the natural olive branches. But you stand by faith. We, the wild and olive branches, have, have been grafted because we stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. We need to have a healthy fear. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Take notice, therefore, if the kind, of the kindness and severity of Elohim, severity to those who fell, but kindness to you if, say if, you continue in, the, in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And if you do not persist in unbelief, if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For Elohim is able to graft them in again. If, for if, you were cut off from the wild olive tree. We were cut off from the world, those of us that, that, that have been saved in Yeshua. And, and contrary to nature, were grafted into one that is cultivated, Yahweh's cultivated kingdom. How much more readily will these, the natural branches that were cut off, be grafted back into their own uh, uh, olive tree? In other words, how much more easily could, could natural Israel be grafted into the kingdom of Yahweh that they were cut off from? If we, who were of the kingdom of the world, of the lost Israel, lost Gentiles, were, were, or have been grafted in. So, so as we think about us keeping the feast, we think about because we are now the kingdom people of Yahweh, spiritual Israel, why do we no longer sacrifice today in, in Jerusalem at a temple? like the law of, of Moses said we should. Well, besides the fact that unlike the Jews, um, as a nation, you know, they rejected Yeshua, the Messiah, we know that the law of sacrifice has not been done away with, but is fulfilled um, now in the more excellent sacrifice and promise of Yeshua the Messiah on Calvary, right? We know this, right? Unlike the, uh, Israel, as a nation, we know that the law requiring a priesthood has not been abolished, but is more than satisfied through the eternal priesthood of Yeshua, who is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? Unlike them, we know that the law of the temple has not been abolished, but is still satisfied and maintained today in us who both individually and corporately make up Elohim's temple or house of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen? Check out what Yahweh says through Isaiah. Isaiah says this through Isaiah 66, 1. He saith, Yahweh, the heaven, this is, thus saith Yahweh, this is Yahweh speaking, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? In other words, who can build with man's hand a house unto me? And where is the place of my rest? He's always looking for the place of his rest. Remember, Yahweh is so big, the heavens of heavens can't contain him. The, the physical outer spaces and galaxies, he, Yahweh is bigger than that because he created that. Amen? For all those things have my hand made, and those things have been, saith Yahweh. But to this man will I look. Here's the answer. Remember, he just asked a question. He said, he said, where is the house that ye build unto me earlier? He said, where is my place of rest? Yahweh says, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and, and of a contrite spirit. Amen? So in other words, he's humbled before Yahweh. And, and trembleth, he has a healthy fear at my word. That is the house that Yahweh is looking for. That is the place of Yahweh's rest. And you and me, if we are humbled in spirit and, and, and needy and hungry and thirst for his word, you know, and, and we fear his word. We, we know that it's the truth and that, that we are to live by or else we die. Amen? Let's look at Ephesians 2. Number 19 says, Therefore you, talking about the ex-Gentiles, are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, spiritual Israel, the parentheses are mine, spiritual Israel, our kingdom people, of the saints and members of Elohim's what? Household. Built on the foundation of the apostles. We're talking about Yeshua's disciples. They were the apostles and future leaders of the Christian church. And the prophets with Messiah Yeshua himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fitted together and grows into what? A holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together into a dwelling place for Elohim in his spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. You see how Yahweh's the same. He's, he's not preaching a different message, is he, brothers and sisters? From old covenant to new, Yahweh's still the same. We know that this, from, from the scriptures like Colossians 2, it's, it, number 2, 16, it says, Therefore let no one judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a festival. In other words, judge, you know, this is Paul talking to the, the church of Colossians, the Gentiles, members. He says, don't let no one judge you by what you eat. In other words, they were eating and drinking, uh, you know, during the feast, such as um, the, the, the wine representing his blood, the, the, the unleavened bread. Don't let no one judge you. They were eating a meal, uh, you know, in regard of, to a festival or, 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 or a new moon or the Sabbath. Probably it's, it's, it's very possible that they had some Judaizers coming to them saying, look, you're not circumcised, preaching that, a false gospel saying that the law justifies them. And unless they're circumcised, they're not truly Yahweh's people. And stuff like that, you know, but we know that the law does not justify us. Faith, we're justified by faith, but a faith that leads to doing the good works of the law. Amen? Because we walk in righteousness. So we, we had these, these, this false gospel going about. And so there were people coming in, outsiders, judging the, 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 the members of the, of, uh, the Colossian church. And, and these are a shadow of the things to come. But the body that, that, that is cast, it belongs to Messiah. Amen? In other words, when we keep the feast of Yahweh, we, 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 they, they, they're, they're attached to the work of Yeshua, the Messiah on Calvary. They're attached to his work of redemption and plan of salvation for all Yahweh's people. Amen? From both past, present, and future on into the kingdom of heaven eternally. Amen? It's a road map. My father, our, our, our previous pastor, said that he who observes the feast of, of Yahweh has come to the melody of life. The feast, uh, they represent Yeshua's way of life for his people. Amen? Let's give Yahweh's praise. Amen? Hallelujah. So, in other words, even when 
without access to a physical temple, even without a Levitical priesthood, the converted or grafted in Gentiles of the first century church were getting together and eating of the unleavened bread of the Passover meal and drinking the symbolic wine of Yeshua's blood. The same goes for the other feasts, the Pentecost and, 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 the tab and keeping tabernacles and, and all that was the commanded feast of Yahweh. They were doing these things. That, that, you know, and so they, they were doing the required watching of the new moon and keeping his Sabbaths. They were being warned not to let outsiders judge them in these practices that they were already doing. So Paul told the Gentile members also of, of, of the Corinth, the Corinth, the church of Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 5 8. He says, Therefore, let us keep the feast. Let me hear you say it. Keep the feast. Amen. Not with the old bread, leavened with, with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now we know that yeah, Paul is, is, is doing a, a parallel about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, about what we should be doing our whole life. But my point is, is that he still, it doesn't take away the point that they were keeping the feast and they were familiar with the feast and what it represented and what it was all about. So be, because mainstream Judaism at that time, during Yeshua's time and during the first century, never accepted Messiah Yeshua and his teachings, the new Gentile converts were persecuted and not given access to the temple or the priesthood. And therefore, they had to adapt as best as possible in the keeping of the feast, according to the truth of Yahweh's word. Uh, unlike the Jews, you know, they could not go to the temple, or, you know, but, but continued eating their version of the Passover meal during 11 bread, wherever they were in the world. You see one scripture where Paul, he's, he's, he's with a, the Gentile church, and he says, I, I must needs to go, because Paul was a Jew, I must needs to go and keep this Passover, go to Jerusalem and keep the Passover. So he had to leave them there during, so he can be in Jerusalem on time to keep the Passover, Paul himself. But today, they, they were Gentiles, they, they did not have that ability to, keep, to go to Jerusalem and, and, and uh, do like the Jews did. And so, so basically, um, they did. They had to go in their own home churches, and you know, and 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 uh, in, in their local churches, or or in their house with their family, and they keep and keep the Jew keep the feast. Um, even Jewish believers, like Yeshua the Messiah, you know, Yeshua. How many know that Yeshua was many times he preached in the temple, and because the Jews uh, believed that him and his followers were a cult, they wanted to kill him. How many know that? Amen. They wanted to kill him. And many times, well, a couple of times he had to run out of the temple to, so that he didn't die before his time. You know what I mean? And so, so um, basically, we, blind Bartimaeus, how many know the story about blind Bartimaeus? Right? He, he, he was a blind man since his birth. And Yeshua put the mud on that. Matter of fact, well, let's, let's, let's look at him in and, 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 uh, John 9, chapter, th I mean, chapter 9, verse 13. It says, they brought to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Yeshua had made the mud and opened his eyes was in, was a Sabbath. So the Pharisees also asked him, how is he, how, how, I mean, how he had received his sight? The man answered, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I can see. Because, because of this, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from Elohim. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there were division among the Pharisees themselves because some saw the truth that Yeshua was who he was and some refused to see the truth. And so, so, um, so, so basically, there, it said, goes on and says, and there was division among them. And so once again, they asked a man who had been blind, what do you say about him? Since it was your eyes, he opened, and he said, he is a prophet, the man replied. The Jews still did not believe that the man had been blind and had received his sight until they summoned his parents and asked, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? So how is it that he can now see? His parents answered, you know he is our son, and we, I mean, we know that he is our son, and we know he was born blind. 
But how he can see or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already determined that anyone who confessed Yeshua as Messiah would be put out of the, or banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said, he is old enough, ask him. So even Jews who believed in Messiah were not allowed to deal be, you know, with the temple and the priesthood and, and could be banned from, you know, from that. Much, much more the, the Gentiles in Messiah. Amen? Yeshua prophesied about a time, this time when the worshipers of Elohim would do so without a physical man-made temple or Levitical priesthood. Yeshua, he, he knew this was coming. Um, he knew that this worship, which included uh, the Moed days of bringing our offerings and remembrance uh, before Elohim, you know, he knew that our worship would, would, would have to be done wherever we were, wherever his people were in the world. And so let's look at John 4, 19, and we'll see this. Sir, the woman said, this is the Samaritan woman, I see that you are a prophet. Because Yeshua just told her something that he could not have known unless it was supernaturally revealed to him. For our forefathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews say that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. The Samaritans and the Jews had the same forefathers, but the Samaritans had mixed in a lot of pagan idolatry and were worshiping Yahweh not according to his law or the way he said to worship him, not according to the scriptures. They were worshiping Yahweh their, their own way. Though they believed in the same God, they, they believed in a God that, you know, didn't follow the commandments. So he says, he says, um, you, you, the Jews say that the, that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. Believe me, woman, Yeshua said, replied, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, meaning you, you, you Samaritans, they don't really know Yahweh. We worship, meaning the Jews, what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and has now come. So Yeshua is looking forward to when the temple will be destroyed in 70 AD. And, and, and the priesthood and, and, and the Jews will be dispersed out of the land. And he's looking to it right now. When, when, when even Jews like himself who, who, who have faith in him are not welcome in the temple. And, and, and are being persecuted and stuff. And be put to death like Stephen and things of that nature would be. So he says, a, a, a time is coming and now is. Amen? You know, and now it come that when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as, uh, as these to worship him. Elohim is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ, is, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Yeshua answered, I who speak to you am he. So I want you to know that after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, even mainstream Judaism, who had forced the, the Gentiles and many Jew, Jews who believed in Messiah not to be able to worship in the, in the temple, and to find a way to, to, keep, to worship Yahweh and keep his feast outside of, of that. May, mainstream Judaism found itself in a similar condition that they had previously put the grafted in Gentiles, believers in Yeshua. Now that the temple was destroyed and they were dispersed out of the land, the future generations of physical Israel also had to adapt to a new templeless reality and learn to worship Yahweh wherever they were in the world. The major difference being that unlike the Christian believers, they had not yet accepted Yeshua as Messiah. They had not accepted him as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You know, and so therefore, he could not sustain them like he could sustain, sustain us. You know, 
as a new covenant temple built on the eternal foundation of his sacrificial work on Calvary. They were not sustained by that. They were lost without a provision. They had nothing that could replace, you know, the, the fulfilled, uh, you know, animal sacrifices that, that, you know, given throughout, given throughout the year under the law of Moses. They had nothing, you know, that, that, you know they had no Levitical priesthood that could serve in the temple or tabernacle on their behalf because they did not accept Yeshua and his priesthood. Without faith in Yeshua, giving, given through Elohim's Holy Spirit, they had a very serious problem, Israel did, natural Israel. The whole problem is that as the people of Yahweh, they could no longer keep the Passover exactly like Yahweh's law originally commanded it should be done under Moses in the land of Israel. Let's look at Deuteronomy 6. It says here, You are not to sacrifice the Passover animal in any of the towns Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. You must only offer the Passover sacrifice at the place where Yahweh your Elohim will choose as a dwelling for his name. So therefore, because they were kicked out of the land of Israel, they couldn't even sacrifice the Passover animal. Some people were like, were like, well, then the Jews can't keep Passover anymore, right? As Yahweh's people. But it goes on, Yahweh goes on and says, do this in the evening, at the sunset, at the same time, you know, when you departed from Egypt. So clearly the Passover was to be killed and eaten in Israel, where Yahweh put his name, which means the, the temple in Jerusalem. Even people living in Jerusalem today cannot exactly, again, keep the Passover as the law of Moses commands because there is no temple, and again, there is no priesthood. So let's look at verse 16, um, Deuteronomy 16, 2. You are to offer to Yahweh your Elohim the Passover sacrifice from the herd and or flock in the place where Yahweh will choose as a dwelling for his name. Just, just like they, they did to the, now the Jews found themselves just like the, uh, the Gentile believers that were grafted in. They found themselves unable to have a temple and to, to, do, to keep the Passover in the place that Yahweh puts his name. Now they had to go, today we are freeing Yeshua. Yahweh puts his name on this. This building is dedicated to Yahweh. We are the temple, you know. We are the, we are the church ourselves, both individually and collectively. So Yahweh puts his name here where we worship him and we, and we, can, and we can come before him, amen, and keep the Feast of Eleven Bread. The, the Jews now... Um, mainstream Judaism had to figure out how to do this too now. So clearly the Passover had to be killed in Eden where Yahweh put his name. So, so let's look. It, it, it look, it look at Leviticus 1 and we'll see that we need a priest to prepare a, a sacrifice in, in general. Leviticus 1, it says, Then Yahweh called to Moses, and spoke to them from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When any of you bring an offering to Yahweh, you may bring, it, bring as your offering an animal from the herd or the flock. If, if one's offering is, is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer an unblemished male. He must bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting for its acceptance before Yahweh. It is to, he is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, so it can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And he shall slaughter the bull before Yahweh. And Aaron's sons, the priest, as to, uh, are to present the blood. So the Aaron's sons and the priest are to present the blood and sprinkle it on all sides of the altar. That is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So it seems this is the problem that, that Israel now has, now that they're not under the land, there's no temple, there's no priesthood working. It seems that the instructions, would, these instructions would apply to the Passover, just like all the other sacrifices or burnt offerings. So we can only worship Yahweh Elohim uh, today. We can't, do, we can't do that. The Jews nor us can go and have a temple or priesthood like the past. We can only go wherever we are and, 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 and memorialize this feast as much as possible according to the truth that Yahweh's law allows us to worship him, you know? 
He, you know, this, 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 is, um, this, is, this is the only thing that we can do because there is no Levitical priesthood. Again, no temple in Jerusalem. So the Jews knew that the Jews knew that when they were kicked out of Israel, the land, that as the kingdom people of Yahweh, the scripture tells them that on the 15th of Abib, the, the Feast of Eleven Bread, they were to do this. Let's look at Exodus 12. They, it says, and this day will be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh, as a lasting ordinance. Say lasting ordinance. For the generations to come. They knew, this is, the, this is also the problem, they knew that Yahweh commanded them that all their generations, they were supposed to continue to keep the feast. They knew this. So they, they are to observe the feast of unleavened bread for on this very day, I brought you your divisions out of the land of Egypt. You must observe this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You must say must. So, and this is repeatedly emphasized. Look at exercise, I mean, Exodus 13. Exodus 13, 5 or 3 says, So Moses told the people, remember, say remember. This day, the day you came out of Egypt, this was, Israel was commanded to do this, you know, out of the house of slavery, for Yahweh brought you out of it by strength of his hand, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. Deuteronomy 7, 18 says, do not be afraid of them. Be sure, say be sure, to remember what Yahweh your Elohim did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. Look at chapter 16, 3 says, you must, say must, not eat leavened bread with it. For seven days you are to, are to eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left the land of Egypt in haste, so that you may remember, say remember, for the rest of your life, the day you left the land of Egypt. So mainstream Judaism know that they're commanded to remember this day. But how can they keep this command even you know, when they're no longer in the land? They no longer have a priesthood or a temple. So they had to figure out a way. These verses clearly indicate that Yahweh's people are not to forget these days. And, and the Feast of Eleven Bread is to serve as a kind of reminder of the deliverance of the Egyptian bondage from, you know, so that the Passover meal and the Feast of Eleven Bread are to be commemorated for when our spiritual forefathers, ancient Israel, were freed from their bondage to, sla bondage to slavery. Look at Exodus 12, 17. It says, so you are to observe the Feast of Eleven Bread, for on this very day I brought your divisions out of the land of Egypt. You must, say must, observe this day as a lasting, say lasting, ordinance for the generations to come. It, this observance was a lasting thing they were supposed to do. But without faith in Yeshua the Messiah, without a temple and, or, and the work of the Levitical priesthood that goes with it, what are the Jews to do? Well, uh, if you look up here, it's, it's, it, this is something I got off of a Jewish website. It says, this task fell to Rabban Gamaliel II, head of the Jewish assembly, the Sanhedrin, with regard to the Passover sacrifice, Gamaliel decreed that the sacrifice should continue in family homes, with each family sacrificing its own goat or sheep. However, other rabbis believed that the Passover sacrifice, like all the other sacrifices, could only be conducted by the priest in the temple, and that like the other sacrifices, should not be conducted until Messiah comes and the temple is rebuilt. So there was division among the, the rabbis, you know, at the, when they were, after they were kicked out of, out of Israel. Some Jews followed Gamaliel and continued to sacrifice goats and sheep in their homes on Passover. Others didn't and saw the practice as apostasy. With, with, within about two generations, the practice ceased and the anti-sacrifice camp assumed control and threatened to excommunicate those who practice it. So, sometime in the second century CE, Jews stopped the practice of sacrificing baby goats and sheep on Passover, until recently, that is. And this, this is entitled Sign of the Apocalypse. 
After the establishment of the state of Israel and the conquest of East Jerusalem and the Temple Mount site in the 1967 Six-Day War, a French group of religious Jews had taken these developments as a sign of the apocalypse. In 1967, they established the Temple Mount and Eretz Yisrael Faithful Movement, which is dedicated to rebuilding the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, a site now occupied by Islamic shrines. The El Aquaza Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. To this end, they, they have been trained, training personal and, 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 and preparing the objects that are required for the temple operation to commence. So right now, they're, they're building parts of the temple to one day, you know, be rebuilt. Right now, they're training, you know, uh, the priesthood to be in there. Um, since Passover 1968, Jewish groups generous, generously uh, funded by evangelical Christians in the United States who share their eagerness for the apocalypse, <laughs> they're looking forward to the apocalypse because Yeshua is coming and they want, they want Yeshua to come sooner, have been trying to sacrifice goats and sheep on the Temple Mount. However, and you can see a picture up here, they have been repeatedly turned away by the Israeli government, which fears their actions could trigger a holy war. The Temple Mount faithful are, are unperturbed and in recent years have been holding practice Passover sacrifices elsewhere in Jerusalem, biding their time until they can successfully sacrifice goats and sheep on the Temple Mount itself. So you see, again, you see that picture. Uh, the Temple Mount activists perform a mock sacrifice of Passover lamb on Jerusalem on March 31st, 2015. Okay? So the Jews who without faith in Messiah don't realize that they are lost. They, they don't know that you know, they, 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 don't, they, they, they just know that before they were dispersed from the land as the natural people of Yahweh, they were originally called by Yahweh to have every generation celebrate these days to commemorate how Yahweh delivered the Hebrews from slavery. So now the question is this, how does all this apply to us today? Who, uh, us who by faith are saved in the light of Messiah Yeshua, our Passover. So here's the conclusion. We as Yahweh's new covenant people in Messiah have a greater, even more important re Elohim added reason to continue celebrating the Passover sacrifice and 11 bread. Because it was during the Passover meal on the first day of 11 bread that Yeshua, as he was preparing his disciples, the future leaders of the Christian church, the apostles, remember it says that that you know, this, this was, the foundation was built on the apostles and the prophets and Yeshua, who was the cornerstone of we, the, the church, amen, the temple of Yahweh. Yeshua was preparing them for his death, burial, resurrection, because he knew that soon he would part from them and they, he would no longer physically be with them anymore. So as Yeshua gave a command during Passover, during, uh, during the meal on the 15th. Let's look at, at 1 Corinthians uh, 11. Yeshua said, um, Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, talking to the, the Gentile believers of the Corinthian church. For, Yahweh, for the Lord Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Here's the command again. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we are still commanded to memorialize, to commemorate this feast in remembrance of Yeshua. Yahweh is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. During Passover, we must remember that Messiah Yeshua fulfilled the symbolic Passover lamb, freeing all who believe in him today from the bondage of slavery and the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death came as a result of disobedience to Yahweh's law. Amen? So, that, so this is what we remember. Look at Deuteronomy 30. 
It says, I have called heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So Yahweh says, choose life so that you and your descendants may live. This is what we're celebrating when we keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that you might love Yahweh with your Elohim, obey him and hold fast to him, for he is your life. And he will prolong your life in the land Yahweh swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at John 8, 34. Yeshua replied, truly, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave. Say a slave. A slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So who do you want to be? Do you want to be a slave or a son? What do you want to be? I want to be a son, right? Amen? For if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So, and according to 1 John 3, 4, sin is the breaking of Yahweh's law. Amen? So concerning the breaking of the law, Paul says this in Romans 6, 1 for 4. He says, what then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Certainly not. How can we who have died to sin live in it any longer? Or aren't you aware that all of you, uh, all of us who were baptized into Messiah Yeshua were baptized into his death? We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Messiah who was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life. Amen? Uh, let's give Yahweh praise. Amen. Hallelujah. This is what we're, when we keep the feast of unleavened bread, we don't just remember what Israel, Israel's deliverance from Egypt. We remember this, a new life out from the slavery of sin, just like the deliverance from Egypt. Amen. Look, you look at verse six, it says, for if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in, in resurrection. We know that our old self, the old us that was, was in the world not living for Yahweh, doing our own thing, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should be no longer slaves, say slaves, to sin. For anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Hallelujah. See, it is in Yeshua, the Mas Yeshua that we are no longer slaves to sin. He, he has delivered us from the bondage of sin and death. As mentioned in Romans 8, where he says, Therefore, there is, therefore, there is, is now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. For in Messiah Yeshua, the law of the spirit of life in Yeshua has set us free from the law of sin and death. Amen? We're no longer slaves to the taskmaster that says we must break Yahweh's law. We must continue to sin. And have, you know, but even in the Psalms, we see that, that, that sin can rule over someone making them a slave. Look, look at here, Psalms 119. David says, establish my steps through your promise. Let no sin rule over me. Amen? In Yeshua, we are given the option to be either slaves to sin or slaves to obedience. Romans 6 says, Do you not know that when you offer yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to the sin leading to death or to obedience leading to righteousness. So thanks be to Elohim that though you were once slaves to sin, we're no longer slaves in Yeshua, you wholeheartedly obeyed, say obeyed, the form of teaching. Remember, we have one teaching. Both, no, no, there's, no, there's not a separate teaching for the Jew and a separate teaching for, for, for the Gentile. The form of teaching to which you were committed. We have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Amen? That is exactly what happened to our spiritual forefathers. The, the Hebrews were leaving Egypt. They were free from the slavery of Egypt and then was given the law so they could learn to walk in righteousness. They, and they were given the option to obey or disobey. 
you know? And so Deuteronomy 11 says, see today, again, I am setting before you blessing and curse. A blessing if, say if, you obey the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, that I am giving to you today. But a curse if, say if, you do not obey the commands of Yahweh, your Elohim, and turn aside from the path I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. So Yahweh, remember, Yahweh still, he could cut us off too, even though we're saved through grace, through Yeshua the Messiah. We can't look, just like he cut off the natural branches, he could cut us off wild olives that have been grafted in to, the, to his kingdom people. But just as the blood was applied to the doorpost in Passover of Egypt, it is the blood of Yeshua that frees us from our sins. Amen? Look at 1 Peter 1. It says, for you know that it was not the, per the perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the, 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 that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah. Amen. Say precious. A lamb without blemish or spot. He was known before the foundation of the world, but was revealed. In the last times for our sake, for your sake, right? And the last scripture we're going to look at is Revelation 1. It says, and from Yeshua Messiah, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the king of, uh, kings of the, of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood. Amen? And they sang a new song, verse 5, chapter 5, 9. Worthy, say worthy, are you who take the scroll and open its seals. Remember, the lamb was the only one able to do this. Because you were slain and your blood had, you purchased for Elohim those from every tribe. Talking about the, not, just Israel, not just the natural Israel, nation of Israel, but from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Amen? Spiritual Israel, children of Abraham. So today, brothers and sisters, we, we are the grafted in new covenant kingdom people of Yahweh have even more reason, say more reason, to commemorate the Passover sacrifice and the Feast of Eleven Bread, to remember Yeshua's body, to remember his blood, amen, as he commanded us to do, right? Because, you know, we remember how he delivered his old covenant people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt and how he delivered us his new covenant people from the bondage of slavery to sin. Yahweh bless. Amen. Hallelujah.